Dr. Vivian Moore, we're the co-coordinators of the Entrepreneurial Center. So what we have today is an alumni panel, so we want to thank the Alumni Association for uh, helping us put this together. So we're going to go ahead and let uh, Mike, uh, you want to introduce them, or you want me to introduce? Go ahead. Okay. Well, <laughs> if you look at the names, I'm <laughs> So we've got Anne here at the, on the left, she's the CFO of the Creative Studio Promotions, correct? Um, Mike Doctor here, he's the um, Motown Property Group, okay? we got Carlos here on the end, on your right. Um, he's the Director for the Latino Business and Economic Development Center. And then we have James here in the middle, he's the CEO and owner of Radiator, is that correct? Okay. Um, so this is our second to last event that we are actually having in the center for this semester. We actually have a lunch and learn on Thursday from 11 to 1. So if your students are interested or if you are interested, please come um, and we can help you out in that modality. Okay. With that, I'll let Mike go ahead and take it. Well, thank you guys. Thank you for, uh, for taking the time out of your day. I've already got schedules and I've already got stuff on How many people actually operate and run a business right now? Little, little bit. Yeah. How many people are wanting to do that? Maybe four seconds. Yeah. Cool. How many people are going to raise their hands no matter what? Okay. You tricked me. Yeah. Come on now. Now this is this is really great, guys. And, and um, what what I think is really awesome about that report is uh, the fact that they care enough about making sure that their students that uh, people who really have adequate information from people who have uh, both experience with that board and experience outside of that board building things and partnering with them and, and you know making sure that projects are moving forward I think are awesome especially when they invite individuals like this who are functionally working in the community every single day um, to, to help give their feedback and, and uh, I'm excited about it I'm excited to be here those of you who have um, heard me battle before, uh, you know a bit about my shtick, but um, I have a couple different degrees from that board, undergrad uh, marketing and then my executive MBA. Uh, currently, I operate a company called Motown Property Group in um, Detroit, Michigan. I spend my time between Grand Rapids and Detroit, and um, I absolutely love being able to come back and help at any way possible. Um, I personally believe I'm here to fix problems help people to teach. I love that that board has given me the base to be able to, to start to grow to do that. So with that, I'm going to uh, allow Carlos to introduce himself and just give a little bit about their backgrounds uh, so you guys know a bit about them and then uh, we'll get into some of the discussion. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Carlos Sanchez. Uh, I also work in academia, so the, the that my title is long because it's in academia. <laughs> Those of you that are in academia understand that. Uh, but basically, you're looking at this the entire center. You're looking at it right now. <laughs> so uh, I treat the, the my job and I treat the center that I that I work for as uh, sort of like an enterprise because I I, need, I fundraise for my uh, for my programs. So I basically sell my services. I recruit. I also sell that service, and, uh, and, and I try to, make, uh, to, to uh, manage the program in a sustainable way. That uh, because of course it's my business. It's my I I, uh, I used to say when I was director of the Hispanic Chamber, I eat what I kill. <laughs> it's not like that anymore. But it's, yeah. so, anyways, that is the center. Um, born and raised in Mexico City, I came to the U.S about 20, in 1998, so whatever that is, 20, 20 years ago. And as soon as I got here, I had uh, I, I did uh, three years college in Mexico. When I came here, I realized hey, I had to finish. And so I came to Davenport as, um, as an adult and uh, finished here. So in, 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 uh, to, to, to your point, um, the university gave me the, the basic the tools but, but also the inspiration in the way in the way Davenport teaches gave me the inspiration to go out and pursue it and be able to have a, um, an entrepreneurial mindset. Although at that time we didn't we didn't speak that that in, in those terms, it was an entrepreneurial mindset. So um, I have to, in my department I have two programs. One is a leadership and professional development program for Latinos 
And the other one is entrepreneurship. I teach entrepreneurship in the Latino community, in Spanish, at the Hispanic Center, uh, using uh, curriculum that was developed by um, co-starters in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and, and now in collaboration here with uh, Spring VR. Awesome. So that's uh, sort of what I, what I do. Awesome. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Follow everybody. Yeah. All right. uh, so my name is uh, Jim Zeru, and uh, uh, as, as, uh, as they mentioned, uh, I'm in the midst of uh, my third startup. So Radiator is a music discovery app. Uh, but I actually, uh, my primary company is named TechConnect. And I started that seven years ago. And that is a network security, network engineering company. So we specialize in high-end infrastructure, networking, network security, wireless e-commerce. Um, and so I actually have a, another company uh, that I started around that same time that actually specializes in ballroom dancing, uh, teaching ballroom dance, and, uh, and, and DJing and, and music at different events. So I actually have several different companies that I'm uh, in the midst of, and uh, I enjoy them all. So um, yeah, so far so good. <laughs> so, okay, so I graduated from Davenport back in 2007, graduated with a degree in network security and network engineering, so a dual major. Uh, soon after that, I actually met my first you know, full-time job right out of college uh, position. I met uh, one of my coworkers in one of my classes. So we actually met, he said, all right, so you know, he was impressed with what I was doing in class, and he said, we need to, we need to hire you. And so, so straight out of college, I was working enterprise healthcare, and I worked there for quite a while. Uh, but before that, even while I was still in school, funny enough, I actually met Anne years ago when I was a youngster, I was still in high school, and uh, I, I was working at, at that location, uh, part-time, kind of uh, nights and weekends, but then I was also working at the West Michigan Whitecaps. And so, uh, so during my time, kind of, you know, through Davenport and after, I've had the opportunity to work at small companies, mid-sized companies, enterprise companies, and consultant companies. And so then, uh, after I worked for Enterprise Healthcare for a while, I decided, you know, I really want to start my own company. I've always had that dream, I've always had that drive, and I was in that, that time of life where I said, you know, now is the time to do it. And so far, it's been the riskiest thing I've ever done, but it's also been the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And uh, so something I feel very strongly about, I love business, I love technology, I love you know music, the arts, I just, I, I, want, I love what I do in the morning, I get to wake up, I love life, and work is just part of that. So that's how I approach life, and that's how I approach entrepreneurship in general. But, uh, I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, good. Well, yeah, I'm Ian Bidro. So, a little bit about me. Um, my background is that um, I graduated from Davenport in 96, so the old building downtown on Colton. And uh, I, um, I went on to get my CPA, so I worked in public accounting from here in town for a while. I got my license, and then I went out and I did some consulting for a while. And I also was for a little while anyways a CFO of a German company actually for North America here for a production company that made um or manufacturing company that made uh, print circuit boards that went inside computers and things and so I too have worked for some smaller and some larger companies and of course for my public account. I kinda got got a kind of a scope you might say of watching different businesses and while I was there I was a what you call profit improvement consultant. So I'd come into businesses and help tweak certain things so that hopefully they would make more money and so negotiating things with banks and vendors and then helping hopefully to meet with marketing and sales and increase the top line too. So um, I'm, I'm what you would call a small business addict because I, um, I I really have a problem with wanting to start businesses every time I see an opportunity. And so the way I've done it is I've partnered with people. So it seems often I run into entrepreneurs who or people who want to be entrepreneurs, they have this awesome skill set Great example is this great concrete guy, right? He is awesome at pouring concrete. If he is business like crazy, and he's really good at it, but he can't even build his checkbook. So, so for a while, I was a partner in a concrete company, and I've done that in waste management, so like a dumpster company. Um, I owned part of a, a screen printing company here in town, and then um, I actually, right now, I am co-owner with a wonderful person who I actually had the opportunity to work with for like seven years, and this is ties into being an entrepreneur, I would say, you know, I've seen a lot of partnerships in, in 
both my experience, but also watching in that public accounting realm, um, good ones and not so good. And so I always tell people, make sure, you know, it's a lot like a marriage. Um, really date for a long time before you get married because it's, it's hard to part ways and it can get really ugly. And um, But if you find the right one, you find that soulmate for your business, it's amazing and I've done that. So my day job is um, I'm half owner in Creative Studio Promotions and believe it or not, being an account, I'm in a marketing company. And so what we do is we make um, online stores mainly is kind of our sweet spot for large companies like Spectrum. We hold the exclusive contract for them. So anytime you see their branded merch like mugs and pens and shirts and things like that, they're logo on and our company has produced that. So um, we do that across the nation and ship around the world. So it's the case we ship around the world for them. So I love what I do. I, I, Someone in that market, I'm in that sales more business role, though. I would say I'm the I'm the business side of things. I have a partner who's amazing at sales. So um, very proud of our team. I'll just a couple bragging rights. We've been in business six years now. We've been top women in business. We've hit the Inc. 500 list, the Inc. 5000 list, um, top, uh, top, I can't remember, I think it was the top 15 companies to watch in the state of Michigan um, two years ago. So we've seen rapid growth. And again, it's because we have an amazing team there. Um, and then I also am a half owner of my husband in a company that produces triathlons. So, you know, a triathlon is a bike run events. And we put on two pretty large events here in Grand Rapids. Um, the Grand Rapids Triathlon and the Michigan Titanium. Um, and then we have a third business as well, and that's our uh, real estate investment company. So we own several um, residential real estate pieces of property. We'd say he manages those, and now we're venturing into vacation properties too. So. We're starting down that road, but yeah, I'm always in conversation with entrepreneurs. I have, I have one on the table right now that is pretty pretty interesting, and I, I always take the time to dig into those because you never know where they'll go, and a lot of them never come to anything, but it's to me always worth the conversation and the exploration. So um, one of the things Mike asked me to do was share a little bit about Davenport and how it truly, I would say, Davenport changed my life. Um, I'll try to do this without getting too emotional because it really means a lot to me. Um, you know, I was in high school and you know I didn't really know what to do. I wasn't sure where to go. I have two sisters that went into the military and um, you know Davenport came to my accounting class of all things and had us set goals. And I look back on that and you know I graduated in 1989, so a long time ago, right? I was a senior. Yeah, I was a senior at the time and. Um, uh, the counselor came in and had us set goals, and I'd never done that before. And so, you know, I look back and, and I shared with Mike, if you look at my LinkedIn profile, you'll see the video that Davenport did about my story and just the inspiration that Davenport provided to me and the direction in my life. I was the first one out of six kids that were going to college, and I was second to be. So, um, it truly had a huge impact on me and my family and just all the wonderful things that I learned through Davenport. And, the fact that the instructors um, had the real life experience really impacted me because, you know, to me, I knew at a very young age for some reason I wanted to have a business or be somewhat of a business owner in some capacity and, you know, talking to those instructors through the years to have them guide me in some of the ventures that I had been involved with and the things, you know, I worked full time while I went to school. And so um, just the things I learned at school and how, how much it helped my career and how much my career really helped my studies. So, you know, I, I try to mentor as many young people as I can, and both formally and informally, and I always tell them that. Like, all that experience and the networking, the people you meet, and, you know, students that I meet, and teachers, and, you know, just everything that's through Davenport and how it's really, you know, shaped not only my career, but my life. And so, um, that that truly is why I have such a love and a passion for Anyways, <laughs> yes, you can't Well, thank you, guys. I mean, I, there's so many things that I want to talk about. Can you talk about that for I mean, No, I'm sorry. Thank you. My background is that So, uh, yeah. You know, so, like I said, graduated in 2007, um, but I also came back and I taught for three years. And so I think back to some of my courses that kind of prepped me for starting a company. So, uh, like I said, at the time, I only took technology related courses. But interspersed with those technology courses were you know, business management, was accounting, was finance. So these are things that you don't, you don't often think of. It's not specifically related to your career. It wasn't at the time. But these were the building blocks that actually allow you to even make this a possibility. Because it's one of those things like you take a marketing class. Like who's, who's an actual customer of yours? Well, they have to, they might have, they have to want what you're selling. 
and they have to have the money at the time. So like, that's what validates a, a, a true lead. So it's the same thing with, with starting a company. Like you have to have the knowledge, but you have to have, like there's, there's this building block, these fundamentals that you need to have. And then you feel like, okay, this is even an option for me to take. So while you're here, I would say some of the big things that impacted my life was there were different technology groups. I actually helped start several, like the West Michigan System User Group. There was the Grand Rapids ISSA, which is a security-related technology group. So there were all these groups and events, and you know, events like this to attend. That uh, you know, I always tell my students, it's, it's like that old saying: it's it's not what you know, it's who you know. We've all heard that. But I would say, don't stop there. It's not who you know; it's who knows you. And when they think of you, is it a positive thought? Do they actually, when they have a problem, are you the front of mind problem solver? So I mean, those are the things that being involved in that work, being involved in these groups, these are kind of things that you know this school has done a phenomenal job providing. Yeah. And you know, I like the, the teachers that I have, they, like I still keep, I, I still keep in touch with some of them because these are people that now have become peers. And I remember the moment where. You know, I started, you know, kind of coming into my own and started uh, being involved in the community. And uh, and there's that point where you're saying, like, okay, the person that was my mentor is now, like, just a, a peer. That's a really cool transformation. And so I'd say get involved, stay involved in your school. Coming to events like this, like, this is how you meet people. This is how you, you present yourself, your personal brand. So I think that's a really important part of if you ever think about starting a company, it's not just... It's not just the product or the service you're providing. You know, as a, as the owner, as the owner, as the entrepreneur, you are really that brand um, for quite a while. Yeah, and you're absolutely right, especially if, if you're going to be taking on the face of that brand or being the primary person building whatever it is that you're going to be building. Um, we found that in Detroit as well. And what we found was that we didn't necessarily. Our, our marketing in that city, if we based it around something of, hey, come and enjoy our product and service, it was not going to, because that's what everybody else was doing. Mm -hmm. Every other company was saying, hey, this is what we have, this is what we're selling, look at this, look at us, look at me, look at this, look at us, look at me, which is the game, that's marketing. It's basically how much attention you can get for the cheapest amount of money. And hopefully that can turn into something. But there's a difference between advertising and branding. And I think what you're referring to is a personal brand and identity. That when a triggering event happens, which means when something happens to somebody where they actually need a product or service that relates anything close to what you do, they're thinking of you first with that top of mind. Um, and that's that's a fantastic point. Um, uh, both Ann and Carlos, I want to go back to you guys here because um, you know one I want to talk about uh, proof of concept and I want to talk about strategy. Because, um, you know, we talked about all the ventures that you started and James, I know you started the time, so if you jump in at any part of this. Um, and when individuals have an idea, ideas are great, but I think a lot of times they lack the perspective of what strategy do I need to have in place for fulfillment of this idea. And um, I'd like you guys to speak to that a little bit, because one of the things that I know I struggled with as a young entrepreneur is I had every great idea in the history of the world. And I just didn't, I, I never had any real way of capitalizing on that, and I never had any real way of proving my concepts. And um, we had a conversation earlier this week around that, and I'd like you to just touch on some of the things that you've seen with some of the, the guidance you've been able to give um, through both your, your foundation and the other entrepreneurial consultant teaching you do. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people have ideas of a business, right? And uh, I, the, sometimes the mistake, if you will, is, is they keep elaborating on that idea because it fulfills their own, um, it feels bad, it feels good for them, right? Because it's a need for them, or it's their idea, etc. So of course it's great, why? Because it's my idea, I'm afraid it's my idea. <laughs> so, but um, the earlier the, you can prove that that idea is, is needed by at least one more person, and if it is, then you might have a business. Because, um, yeah, as, as, as an example, people will come to me during the class and say, I want to start a restaurant. Why? Well, I love to eat and I love to cook. <laughs> you know, who else loves your food? Well, my husband. 
my kids. Yeah. So aside from that, you're the captain, really captain. <laughs> <laughs> Who else enjoys your food? Like, well, I don't know. Okay, then you don't have a business because you're not going to sell your food to your family, right? So that is the proof of, of, of the of the concept. And in the earlier you can do that, the the the, the sooner you can do it, the, the, the sooner you can get move on with following that, that route of the business or move on to a different idea, right? Because, um, yeah, uh, I think a lot of people, when, when we talk about uh, uh, entrepreneurship, it's about having ideas, it's, it's more about solving problems rather than just coming up with an idea, right? It's, it's, what, is, what is hurting people, uh, what, well, uh, what is needed? And um, it, it is interesting that Ant mentioned uh, uh, transforming, for example. The, the dirtiest, the awfulness, the, 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 the uh, earlier in the day that, that, that can happen is the, the, the better the business you would have, I guess. Because mm -hmm. nobody likes to take trash out, right? Nobody likes to touch trash, nobody likes that. So um, things like that are, are, just, are just phenomenal. But of course, you need to prove that there is at least one more person that, that uh, coincides with you, that, that has that pain, that has that need, that people come to you like, oh yeah, I really would love you if someone does what you just mentioned. That's perfect. And, and um, I'm going to build on that step, and I want to go to from there, once you have that proof of concept, Developing the strategy, and then I want to end uh, James a little bit talking about sort of risk too involved because you mentioned in your intro what you did was the riskiest thing you've ever done, and that's just something that's inherent if you're going to be a part of this, and then uh, we'll open it up to some questions if that's okay with me too. Um, but you know, one of the things that, that I see is once people prove concepts, once they have okay, this can work. Then it comes into how do I strategically make this work for me? I can lay concrete, right? <laughs> but how do I make this a business? Being able to do something and being able to fulfill a need is not necessarily making a business out of it, right? So you have built businesses from that standpoint, from the not necessarily the qualitative, what service can I provide, but the quantitative, what are the things that can be tested and measured to actually make this a business? Um, so if you could speak a little bit to the strategy that you had to come in from, from the business side of things and maybe coach and teach people on that they're missing from being really, really good um, technicians. I have a, if anybody's, has anybody ever read the E Myth? Anyone yeah. ever read that book? I was just about to say yeah. that's the book I recommend to everyone. Exactly. I tell people if you don't have time to read that book, you don't have time to start a company. You're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah, you I are agree. not anywhere I, near ready. And most people, most people who operate small businesses, unfortunately, fall into the vast majority of the pyramid, which is the technician. Uh, the right. technician mindset, the technician work that was functional for doing stuff. And they can only grow so far, right? They can only do so much. And the strategy is what helps them bring out of that. So if you could speak to that, I, I would, I think everybody would have a lot of that. Yeah, so in my old consulting days, we used to call working on or in. We actually yes. used to do a half, but you either turn it around on or in. You know, I think it was full time even. And um, so, of course, I'm a numbers person, right? I'm an accountant. So it, 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 that is what it all adds up to me. So it's um, using those numbers to help determine, you know, one, where you're going and where you've been. And, um, you know, if we sit down and we do some projections and, you know, we can say, okay, this is how much cash you need in the bank because you're going to be turning a loss for the first few months or years. Um, where's that money coming from? You know, often I have entrepreneurs who will be like, we were talking about this on the phone a little bit. It's like, ah, I made a decision to start a business and it's Friday and you're putting your new year your full time job on Monday and it's like, huh, how about we do both for a while and let's, you know, prove out this concept a little bit. And not to say that um, maybe there is only one other person who loves what you do or, or buys, but, um, you know, you can still do it on, you know, something on the side and really get a lot of enjoyment out of that. And I actually find out several people that I, I deal with who have multiple streams of income. And so a side business is awesome, actually. And um, so it, it kind of gives you some more passion and some more fire, you know, and you're interested in it. You still have your full-time job that's paying the bills. So, um, yeah, for me, it's sitting down doing those projections and then doing some market testing. 
um, starting kind of small, maybe leaning on some friends who might be able to pitch in and help you out with some things you're doing, depending on where you're at financially, if it really that's what it kind of all boils down to. And are you self-financing? Are you, you know, are you pulling this out of your house? Are you putting it on credit cards? Let's hope not. Um, you know, are you have some investors? What does all that look like? And that kind of determines where you go from here. Um, obviously, there's like certain components you've got to talk about, you know, sales and marketing, and then what about production or fulfillment, and then you've got, you know, your accounting side of things, and then who's going to be making some of the managerial decisions and the vision type stuff. But, um, you know, sitting down and kind of nailing that out, and maybe even if it's not a full fledged business plan, at least answering some of those questions ahead of time. And then it's, you know, determining what kind of entity are you going to set up? You know, S Corp, C Corp, LLC, you know, sole proprietor, go for the checkbook, start getting things rolling. And then that's where the rubber meets the road kind of is, okay, the money coming in and out. And what does that look like as time goes by? So some of the people that I've dealt with, you know, they've already got the idea rolling and they might just be struggling financially. It could be some tweaks. But if you're starting something brand new, um, yeah, how much of a check can you write and how long can you run on that money? And how quickly can that you know that income start covering it? So um, there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to that, especially depending on the type of business. You know, is this a service business where you're the only expense, or maybe a computer, or you know, you've got a home office, or are you, you know, talking to someone right now about starting like a, a it's called a tuk tuk service in another country, you know, to capture cruise ship business. Well, there's some pretty big investments there, you know, right, and equipment and things like that, and um, it's very intriguing, it's pretty cool, but um, how much you know do you have and how far is it gonna go and how long can you live? I, I coached someone who would open a consignment shop and quite honestly I've always dreamed of opening a consignment shop and um, so I was really excited to help this person and um, you know it was better have you know 12 months of rent in the bank because you just don't know and you know it was too bad because around month seven or eight they would gotten behind and they just didn't have enough to get started and they chose to start anyways. They quit their full-time job and man, just when the business started getting going, the landlord's evicting, right? And now all of a sudden the business, they just thought, oh, what if you would wait a year to start and you would have saved a little more? So I try to help people not not do that. I mean, the energy and the momentum and all that, I mean, the opportunity for success now might be out years because you, you kind of lost it all, right? I mean, you, you started too soon or you didn't plan well enough or you never want to have failure to launch because you want to overanalyze, but I don't usually find that with entrepreneurs, right? They they want to go now that we want they're like, it'll figure itself out. I just know I love this and it's a great idea and I'm going full speed ahead and then by the time it all comes to fruition, I mean, it can, it can cost you marriages, it can cost you your home. I mean, it can be, it can be horrible, you know? And so I really feel a duty almost to help them hopefully try to see that future as much as possible. And you're never 100%, but you can you can test the waters a lot. And the other thing to help with all of that is pick someone who's been there before, right? And if you want to open a coffee shop, even if you can't talk to the local coffee shops, go to the next city. Call anyone you can. Talk to people who've owned them, you know, who failed, who succeeded. Um, as unique as you probably think your idea is, Guaranteed, there's probably one pretty close to it out there somewhere. So tap into that, and it's amazing how much entrepreneurs want to talk. Right? Look at us. Like, we <laughs> love talking. Right, right. 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 Both successful and not. I mean, I some of the best lessons I've learned is working for owners. One ended up filing bankruptcy. And boy, did I, I! I was very young. I was still in school, and I just watched the whole. And I was just like, Why are you doing? Why are you building this building that you can never afford? Well, it was the demise, you know. So it was. They were great lessons for me to see success and failure. And, I feel kind of fortunate in that way that yeah. I, I got to be so There's close. a group coming here to an event. It's called Failure Labs. And I think it was actually started by someone here uh, in West Michigan. But it's, 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 it's become a national um, event where they actually bring together people and they talk about failures or things that have gone wrong. And like you're saying, you learn more. Uh, it's, it's much cheaper to learn from other people's mistakes mm -hmm. than to go through them yourself. Much cheaper. That's, that's huge. And, you know, it, it, and it just it all leads back to the idea of risk. 
right? And that's I mean, and that's kind of what it does, right? And so there's, there's going to be risks in every single business venture that you do. It does not matter. There is no definition of the word entrepreneur that does not have the word risk closely attached to it. But so there's risk working for someone else too. And there is. So it's, yeah, a hundred percent. And it's and it's what type of risks you want to take, what you want to have, and, and there's a mindset around that. Um, and there's there's a couple different ways to to think about that. You know, um, obviously you can mitigate the risk by keeping things small, right? You don't want to over leverage. You don't want to over uh, extend yourself in any way, shape, or form. Or if you have a system for fulfillment, which some people do, they have a proven concept that they've done over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And you know that that concept will be proven, or at least there's very good data to support that. You can begin to take bigger risks. You can begin to put more zeros behind whatever number you started with in that business plan. But it comes back to having that system for fulfillment. Because it is a lot cheaper to figure out something from somebody else that hasn't been in it, which is why you see franchises that have a, the 90th percentile success rate. Why? Because they have a proven concept. And they get to say that they sold a billion burgers, even though that location has never even come close to that. Right? So they get to do those types of things. And so if you have that type of fulfillment, you can very easily step into those risky waters of fuel. But I think a lot of times people fail to launch because they don't know what that fulfillment looks like. And they don't really have any type of real concept to be able to actually functionally stay consistent with that over the long haul. Either they have a budget properly, they don't have the right experience or whatever it might be. But you still have to, in this world, be okay with the idea of risk. Right? Um, I have a different concept on credit, debt, and leverage than maybe other people do because of how my business model is built and because of how I build a business. So I have zero problem putting a new business venture or a new concept on a credit card if I know I'm going to get a return on that and pay more than what I'm paying in interest. Because then whatever I just purchased became free because it's not my money to begin with. But I have to have a system to fill on that debt. If I don't have a system to fill on that debt, I'm in a whole heck of a lot of trouble and nobody's going to give me any money. Right? And that's where some of those different things come in, credit scores, paid ex scores, all that other stuff. It's important to understand that, uh, specifically from, from an entrepreneurial or investor perspective, because if you do, if you are, you're like an entrepreneur, you're more scared of having a job than you are of going into that family. You just are. If you're geared and truly wired that way, you just are. And that's, I mean, that's one of the things I'd like you to talk about because you start companies over and over again. You've had the corporate backgrounds, yep. right? And and you're you're a very analytical guy. You're an IT guy. Inputs equal outputs. It's just a little. Well, you're talking about <laughs> risk. I mean, then yeah. you're talking to a security person. Like, exactly. That's what we spend <laughs> all day talking about. Yeah. And so there's, and, you know, as, as you're talking about the way you leverage that, mm -hmm. I keep thinking, boy, I hope your algorithm. Good. Sure. Because like, that's, that's what it is. You've got yeah, this process right. where you're just you're, you're making sure your income outweighs the debt you're paying yeah. out. Like, but it's 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 uh, you know, it reminds me of playing poker. Like, mm -hmm. good good poker players know how to gamble. Great poker players are not gambling mm -hmm. because good poker players play with the cards. Great poker players play with the people. Mm -hmm. They're working statistics. They know odds. They have an algorithm. They have a process. They're not. It's it's a different type of mentality that you approach the game with. And so, uh, you know, when it comes to, I guess, risk or starting a company in the technology world, we often talk about an MVP, a minimally viable product. And so, it's a very common you know phrase in the technology, the you know, the app startups, where you want to just get the basic app out there. You don't want it too complicated. It doesn't have to be complete. I mean, Google Mail was in beta for like how many years? Seven, eight years, like. But everybody uses it today. I mean, the Facebook was was just. I mean, Zuckerberg started it, you know, over a weekend, mm -hmm. and it blew up. So I mean, there's there's these type of things where you can quickly bring something to market. You can test it. You can try it. Um, it's a very common platform <laughs> idea. Um, but when so I guess me personally, when I started uh, TechConnect, so it was, it was kind of interesting. I left Enterprise Healthcare. It's the largest employer uh, in West Michigan. You can probably figure it out if you need Google searches. But um, so it's a very secure role. Uh, there were two people in the company that, were, that was doing what I was doing. Um, so like job security was just fine. When people heard that I decided I was going to start my own company and I was just leaving, um, 
I think some people thought I was probably crazy. They probably thought I'd be back in three months. Um, but I said, you know, this is it. And so at the time, I knew I had, I, I could go back. So in some ways, it was it was a risky thing. But there, were, there was also a time where I'm like, you know, I could get a job for other companies as well. But also, I had spent multiple years before that building relationships in the community. So I knew people. I knew that this idea, people need technology. They need someone to install the network. They need someone to set up their servers. And security is becoming ever increasingly in demand. So it's one of those things where, yes, it was risky. But in some ways, it was it was kind of a no-brainer. I'm like, people need this. It's, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, so you, it's kind of like gambling, where you know, you're hedging your bets. You could fail. But you like, you've always got a back plan. So, so and, and that all sounds good, but talk about what it felt like in here when you made that decision. Because there's a lot of people, I think, who are trying to make that transition or look at making that transition. And it's what that feeling makes them think, like, oh my gosh, they're crapping their pants because it's a, a brand new experience. That never, and they should be. Right? Because it's brand new, you've never done it before, and it shows that you're human. Oh, oh yeah. But oh. how do you, how do you do so it? So the fear, okay, so the fear of the unknown yeah. is, I would say that's, that's like there's this, you know, this, this gap that you're trying to jump, you know, from one plateau to the other. So it's the fear of the unknown. And one of my mantras is always remove the fear. Remove the fear. Even if you're just creating, you know, something simple, let's, let's bring it down to a small scale. It's like just an event. Well, where do people park? Where are they going to, you know, what should they wear? You know, is there going to be food? Well, do, does anyone have any like gluten allergies or you know, or wheat allergies? Or, you know, so you remove the fear. So you always be very descriptive with your, your information. So starting a company, there's a lot of fears. What do I do about taxes? What do I do about accounting? You know, what do I do? How do I actually fulfill? I have this idea. How do you actually build the fulfillment side of it? And actually, get the product out there. So there are processes, there are tools, or something called the business canvas uh, that's very useful. It's uh, like, you know, you can do it on a piece of paper, and it's all quadrants. And so you can actually think of how would I actually fulfill this business based on an idea. Who's your target market? So what is the value proposition that you have? How is that value proposition going to reach the target market? Well, the target market's going to reach, or the value prop reaches the target market by market. And then what are the revenue streams that are returned? So you kind of create this, this cycle. But then you think about on the fulfillment side, well, here's my value prop. What do I need to actually fulfill that? So who are my, who are my key players? And how does that return? How do they actually look? So you think about things this way. It's a very, very simple process or algorithm, if you will. But just taking someone's abstract and putting it down on paper will remove so many fears. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes, OK, now I've identified it. So in psychological worlds, they say, if you have these fears, the best way to deal with the fear is to name, identify it, say, this is it. And then think, well, what's the worst that can happen? Mm -hmm. And I would say that also fear goes directly related to uh, risk. Mm -hmm. Like entrepreneurship is about, this, about risk. There's no matter uh, it, that, that that's what it is. And, and you go through life as an entrepreneur mitigating risk. Mm -hmm. right? But also you have to find out how much risk can you stop. How much risk do you feel okay with? And going to that point, you know, the, the MVP, the minimum viable product. There are ways where you can prove your product or your concept, mitigating risk by starting small. So again, someone comes to me and says, I want to start a business. Why? Because they see themselves opening, sometimes certainly, right? They see themselves opening the doors of the store or the restaurant and people coming in, oh, hello, how are you doing? And she kind of did this a, a Disney type of thing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, 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 exactly. But in reality, they open on one day, and nobody walks in, right? And then there's three months later, and the rent is due, and they don't have the rent. Why? Because they quit their jobs, and all of a sudden, it's like this is not what I was promised. Or well, not promised, yeah. right? So what I tell people is, instead of spending forty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars on opening a restaurant next Monday. Start selling your wares Monday, right? So in, in our case, you sell the sale. Start selling tamales, right? And you go go to an office and say, here, I have three dozen to one. And then, of course, that's how you prove your concept again. Like, worst case scenario, you're out $400. Mm -hmm. Because in reality, you can't make the tamales to save your life. <laughs> <laughs> but then, that, but now, now you know, right? And then don't quit your job, right? Do it on the side. Now, of course, 
Elon Musk, right? You can't build SpaceX on an MVP, right? <laughs> you have to build this massive right. thing. It's kind of a barrier to entry. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, uh, but, but, but almost for every, every line of business, there is that way of starting small. All the way to start small is work for someone else. Mm -hmm. That's where you that, that's where you and your uh, that's where you learn. That's where you you know get your feet wet. And then again, also that's at some point you're looking at your boss, the owner of the company, and you're like, my God, he's miserable as an entrepreneur. <laughs> I'm not doing that yeah. right? because not all not all of us are caught to be uh, to be entrepreneurs, and, and, and it's not good or bad. Some of us are got to work for someone else, and that's absolutely fine, right? But it's about when someone wants to start a business, uh, uh, that individual, and of course, if he or she, if they're married, there's a, there's a partnership, both have to analyze what is our tolerance for risk. And, and be, and, and write it down, put it somewhere in there, because we have to, uh, we have to see it. And it's got to be black and white. It's related to cop. It's related to money. It's related to sometimes some uh, and, and I love the practical points because some people, the moment, the moment you say go out and do it at a tiny scale, just do it, make it. They will become. They won't do it. They refuse to do it. But they have these big, grandiose ideas. Like it's huge, abstract. You say that's like they see themselves. Being the CEO, greeting people at the door, giving free drinks at the bar. <laughs> that is not reality. No. Reality is when you're in the back of the kitchen, scraping down because your, your chef didn't sh like show up. So make them do something practical at a tiny, tiny scale. Most will not. They say, you know, success comes in overhauls and it looks like work. So people turn it away. Very common. But this, the other thing that you, you mentioned is ownership. I think of ownership. I think about this a lot. Like, I try to talk to other, you know, there's a lack of diversity in technology. So we always talk about how do we improve the, the different groups so there's more representation. It's, it's, it's ownership. Ownership. And not, like I said, not everyone is meant to be an owner of a company. But you can own your job. You can own your actions. You can own your mind. And the moment you start taking responsibility for your actions, your mind, your habits, your character, your life changes. How you see the world changes. Life doesn't just happen to you. You can go out and have the world. That's a fundamental psychological change that is so powerful that suddenly it's it's you're you're in charge. You have control of what's happening. It's amazing. So just do it. Do it. Try it. <laughs> do it. Yeah, do it. Quick, quick, quick story. I was, I was uh, uh, lucky enough to have gone to a ticket training. A training trainers um, at the Kaufman uh, Foundation. They teach entrepreneurship, right? And uh, so we, we we were being taught how to teach entrepreneurship, and at some so there were deans, there were professors, there were etc. Um, and at some point they say, all right, this this uh, five of you uh, come up with an idea. Five minutes, we get this idea. All right, now go to the university that across the street, University of Kansas University, Kansas State, whatever. Uh, so now prove your concept, right, and talk to students. My God. I mean, the, unfortunately, there were some professors, some deans, some of them, they were like, they would just go along on oh, that's kind of beneath. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God, I can't this is nothing. Now, of course, for me, it was like, I never done it, but I have to do this. If I'm going to teach someone, yeah. I have to do this, right? Yes. And of course, there were also other deans, other professors that would be like, okay, I'll hold it, the, 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 uh, the recording. Uh, um, on the cell phone, and then you know, do the uh, interview, or whatever. But um, but yeah, the moment that you open the door and um, and you talk to the first customer, that is when you feel you know. Mm -hmm. I don't, I've never had that, and you know, you feel like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is for me, or like no, this yeah. is not. Yeah. No. And, and someone complains, someone yep. complains. and that's it. So many, so many, so many great things. I wish. I wish, I wish <laughs> um, the the starting small and that proving that concept and getting over that fear and that hump and that this right here. It it's okay, guys, if you can't do that, and it's okay if entrepreneurship isn't the path that you need to go down. That's an okay thing too. 
right? But you won't know unless you act, unless you do something, unless you try it. And that's where a lot of people fall short, is that mindset, that action mindset, being able to actually, I'm reading a book called Extreme Ownership, right now. It's written by Lady Gary and Jocko something. They're like former Marines, of course, named Lady and Jocko, which is a good name to see, which sounds really cool just by the names, right? But they talk about one of the things that they teach Navy SEALs whenever they're in a really high intense situation is to stop, look around, make a call. Stop, look around, make a call. Is that the point? Yeah. Observe, orient, decide. Exactly. You in, in the action, if you don't act, nothing is ever going to happen. It's basic physics. <laughs> not <laughs> acting is a decision. It is. Yeah, and a lot of people default to, and sometimes it's, it's often not the right decision. And so then you accept whatever happens to you. Yes. That's, that's Every nice. time somebody comes to a point of decision, what they're doing is they're running it through their their um, their, their point of view, their, their point of origin, their concept of how they believe things are going to be. And what they're saying is either yes, no, or wait. Well, wait is the exact same thing as no. There is no difference between those two. So if you have enough information, and in, in my case, and I, you know, and when I have 60% of the information, I can ask because I can contractually tie something up and get time to be able to, to figure out all the unknowns, right? And but in some cases, you need to be able to act. You're not having all the information. You need to be able to analyze what's around you, problem solve to the best of your knowledge. And even like you know, like you said, it gets a lot of people in trouble if they're like, I'm going to act and just figure it out, right? That gets a lot of people in trouble. And, but but you still have to be willing to take that step. The willingness to take that step and act in those small increments around things that you can control and taking that type of ownership in that type of situation. Um, I think that separates a lot of people. And I think sometimes it holds people back because they haven't been taught how to do that and they haven't ever experienced that. Um, and, and that's something that, that, uh, that I mean, just, just great feedback. I want to stop, though, on the general conversation that we're all having up here, uh, and I want to open it up for some questions um, and, and just see what you guys might, uh, those of you who came in who were looking at starting a business, those of you who are here who are looking for some sort of um, feedback guidance in whatever way, shape, or form from these three really good individuals who uh, came out here and were willing to share with us. Um, what do you guys have for that? A question. Yeah. Um, you're, you're talking about your business stuff, and I don't know what your, your, your family status is, but how do your significant others react to you doing this, I guess? I have a problem. I'm trying to get moving on, but my wife is rich. She grew up in the, her dad worked in the same place for 33 years. She refuses to go anyplace else where she's at, despite the fact she's miserable, and she sees me as someone who has to do that, and I'm refusing. And so it's a real battle. You know, the only time she supports it is when she sees dollar signs. And as soon as you figure out how to do it as fast as I need to, she shuts down and goes someplace else. Yeah. 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 So how was that for you guys with that? I was saying, I'm single. So, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so, 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 I had a little advantage where I met my husband. I was somewhat involved with the business, but he he was not at all. He never, this is like a whole other kind of world for him, I might say. But he, um, He's being a little more, I would say, conservative, but he analyzes a little longer than I do. And as much as I say you need to wait, at times it's definitely I'm a person of action once the decision is there. It's proven I'm like, go now. And um, but I think it, it just, you know, I think understanding what your spouse needs, and if if she's unsure about the money, then setting expectations and goals and things. And so that's what we'll do is. We just made a recent investment, and I spent a little more than what we had agreed on at the time, but now he's glad I did to, to acquire this, and it's, it's paying for itself, but we sat down and said, okay, what are we willing to live with, and how much the first year, how much the second, and what's the payback here, and so we agreed on that part. So that gave him the security of making the investment, and you know, knowing what he needs um, is, is important because if he doesn't agree, I won't do it. I won't because I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna give that up for for what it's gonna. This would, it, you know, this business is not gonna give me what I get with this relationship. And I am a two and a half year old now, and so I've started a lot of these things. And then I, and that came into my life. You know, she came into my life, and I'm like, whoo! It, it's a balance. It's a juggling act, and so it's a lot of communication. But you know, just him knowing, or maybe her knowing that I pick you first over everything. 
that, that's what is all they need to hear. That's sometimes what I need to hear from him for things, when he wants to do something. And then I'm like, oh, okay, as long as I do know I'm still first, I'm not battling that, then all of a sudden the law comes down and I'm open a little more to risk and a little bit more ideas and things. And so, but it's it's setting the expectation. And, you know, I hate to say this, but as women in general, I think we're more security motivated. And I got to know that you're not going to lose our house and our kids aren't going to have nowhere to live. Like, you know, your crazy idea is great and all, but here's the deal. This is all we're willing to put in. And once you hit that, you're done. Is that cool? Okay, then go. But you're not touching this. Like, this is off limits. This is our families. And so conversations like that are really important, I think. So, and I, from the public accounting days, there's nothing worse to watch, you know, is a business, a, a marriage be destroyed by the business or the business be destroyed by a broken marriage or both, you know, and it, it goes hand in hand. It goes, I can't tell you, if, if, I always dreamed that I was like, okay, I need to hook up with a divorce attorney who knows business owners because if a business owner goes for a divorce, his business, his business is so vulnerable. Like, it's, it almost always, a lot of times, bankruptcy fault, I mean, it just all goes together. And so, the person is probably going to be attacked. The very thing that they feel broke up the nerves of your business. They're going to go through Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, sorry, I don't know if that answered it. But, but that helps. Sure. I mean, it gives me that encouragement. But yeah. You know, I will, I will put it in, in two entrepreneurial concepts. Uh, uh, yeah, a proof of concept and also risk mitigation, right? So, there's, it seems like there's two different ways. Of you see risk, you're probably more. She's probably risk averse, and you're then you're not. Right. So I guess trying to find a middle middle ground, push her a little bit more, and you give a little bit. So that's why. How you probably by starting small, she will feel a little bit more comfortable. Okay, that's fine. Uh, but the second piece is you are the concept. Yeah. You see, see yourself as the concept, right? Meaning, assuming that you are an expert in that field where you want to move into business, right? You know, every time you make a a, a right decision, it's like you're proving to that other person, to, you, to your spouse, that, um, that you are on the right track. Of course, you're uh, assuming that you're human, you, you is there's never a 100% right rate of, of, of a fail. So, uh, so but, but she will come, uh, will be, she will start to feel more and more comfortable, uh, uh, kind of moving that threshold of risk a little bit higher, a little bit higher. Uh, in the last piece, uh, or yes, uh, follow on hand, uh, right on, on assuring, in a way also on, on paper, not a contract, but you know, I would not do ever this. Put risk our home, right. our family, our kids, so it's my life. So that, so like. And write it down. Yes. It's <laughs> <laughs> just mitigating that risk, right? I would so, say the tiny, tiny. The in there is, you know, you talk about, you know, identifying failure. Be okay with failure. You have to be okay, but also be able to define failure. Mm -hmm. And that's something a lot of people don't think about because there's been a lot of people that have started a company and they they kept it alive mm -hmm. way too long. Knowing when to say it's time. Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. Know when to cast your ships, cut your losses, however you want to phrase it. Um, but identify what's a success, what's a failure, and have those numbers and like have that contract with your wife. Um, I, I have a really tight contract with our clients, and uh, it keeps everybody friends. It works well. So, so, and it, what I was going to say that I'm, I'm not married. I was. Um, I was married to an individual who had a much different perspective on um, comfort and risk than I did. At the end of the day, for me uh, and for her, <laughs> it was better for us not to be. But one of the things we didn't do, um, and we never did. And this was on me uh, as somebody who was the risky individual. Was we never sat down and established really why I wanted to risk everything, right? So like, okay, assuming I start now, two years from now, five years from now, what does my life need to look like in order for this to be a good decision, and why is that so important? Because people are going to respond to the why more than they're going to respond to the what. Once you have the why, and Simon Sinek wrote a great mm -hmm. book called Start with Why. So absolutely yeah, yeah. Yeah. circles. Yeah. And and um, if, once you get to that why, and you guys can both get behind that, then all it is is about a strategic conversation on how to get there. Because what you're really talking about is yes, you're talking about energy, but you're also talking about business partnership. And you're not necessarily looking for someone to give you permission. You're looking for support. Right? And gaining support usually comes from having a conversation around this is what do I want to accomplish, why? 
And then from there, it's about defining, okay, what are the expectations, the clear expectations of this? This is what I want to do to get to the why. This is what it looks like if it works in two years. And this is what it looks like if it doesn't. And this is how we're going to do it. That is something that I've seen through, um, part of what I do is try to teach new entrepreneurs how to get started the right way. And I, I run into this scenario quite a bit. The way I solved it now is my girlfriend runs my business as the operations manager. So that also helps. So she has a lot less um, concern. Yeah, yeah, she has a lot less concern on, on that too. So I hired her there, so she is, you know, in charge of this. But in the, in the same respect, having that defined, um, having that definition there on both ends, and really knowing why you're trying to get to this, has helped people a lot. Um, so, so meaning I have to figure that aspect out because I would, you know, yeah, I, I'm one of those. I'm a, I'm a constant uh, learner. Uh, I look at any opportunity to learn about any subject, get my hands on to the best of my ability, yeah. and a lot of my business ideas come from that. Meaning sure. I'm not necessarily an expert, but I'm smart enough to go, hey, I have a potential here. Yeah. So, you know, my my, my poor wife who goes. I've never heard you talk about her right. before. What do you mean you want to do this? So she doesn't <laughs> understand why. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. Right? So and maybe you don't know either. And yeah. so maybe that's a yeah. conversation you guys should have together. That could be fun too. You know? Um, and it can be scary sometimes. But it can be fun. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. John, you have a question too, my man? All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I haven't really had. I've never really been scared of proof of concept or risk because I kind of burn the candle at all projects. And you, so, for example, I have a technology consulting company right now. Good. It's just sole proprietorship, maybe six to ten clients at a time. But when I first got that idea, I went to the local grocery store and talked to everybody that walked in. And I don't know what to think of my idea. It was it got pretty good feedback, so I went door to door after that. And that's why I proved my concept before I like actually started. I'm not scared of that. But the one fear I do have is I recently just had a, like right now I have a four and a half. And having more time to work. And so, being a person that burns the candle, you know, all three ends, um, the work life balance, which is exactly what he was kind of talking about, um, is something that I ask everybody that um, has that entrepreneurial spirit, you know, has that um, has a project. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much going to be my question, but for the most part, you guys pretty much answered it and came to the same answer that I have about communication. So, yeah, you know, in technology, your current revenue is great. What's that? Recurring revenue. Figure out a business model that supports the lifestyle that your student and other needs. Yes. So like, if it needs to be guaranteed income, well, then you should go into MSB. Yeah. Like you should go into a managed service provider type structure. And, and whether you know whether it's with that company or, or whatever right. you may do, you know, it's just my it's the mindset that concerns me. Because if whenever I do, I approach it that same manner. Sometimes I take. But I think that's that's a huge point because you know you mentioned this. Not everyone's meant to be a business owner, but you can be entrepreneurial in a Fortune 5 company. Like just because it's a gigantic company, you can still take that entrepreneurial uh, the energy and that mindset, like and what you can do. Like you will quickly climb that corporate ladder if if it's an entrepreneurial focused company. Um, I've been to some companies. You know, being consultant, we get to see a lot of behind the scenes things, and some of the companies are just no waves. <laughs> no way, it's 95. Here's your cube, don't leave it. Um, some, some people try to do that. I I not. I, I, <laughs> I another point you brought up that was good about work like balance. You know, when I had my daughter two and a half years ago, that was something I was faced with because I, I really two businesses I'm pretty involved with. So the, the, the creative studios and then the triathlon is, is almost a full time job too. So um, my, my answer has been delegate, delegate, delegate. And mm -hmm. so I hired personal assistance. I have a friend who comes and helps meal prep for me, put freezer meals in the freezer. And so when I get home from work, you know, I, I don't go into the office until 9 or 10 o'clock and I made that meal with my partner, my business partner, and she covers mornings, I cover afternoons. And then I leave around 3 to pick my daughter up and then after she goes to bed, I'm on the laptop. But, you know, when I get home, you know, I pull a meal out of the freezer, I throw it in the oven, and then I'm playing with her because I'm not going to, you know what I mean? And, and I talk to a lot of women business owners about that. And, um, you know, it's it's hard because I love to cook. I, I you know I like to clean. I don't mind doing those things. But when she came into my life, I said, man, you know, am I gonna spend an hour preparing a meal and then doing all the dishes? You know what I mean? And so I just I have to give that up for a few years. And being what I think is really a great homemaker, let's call it, and business owner, because 
being with her is more important. And so you do, and I say no to a lot. I mean, I say no a lot. I get invited to a lot of groups and boards and things like that. I'm very choosy because that's the deal with my husband and I. And I'm like, keep me in check because I like to say yes to everything. And so it can be, um, it, it's a real detriment to the family life. And in the end, I that's my number one. Like, it's got to be my number one because that is truly where I find the most joy in life, right? I mean, a business, they can come and go. I can find other business, you know what I mean? Whatever. And, but, boy, that is very placeable to me. So, yeah. It's really about, like, consciousness of that, too. Yeah. You know, you can say it's about, it is yeah. number one, but it's no, really I, easy to just yeah. get those of and things. Yeah. Back I, I, have a, I have an accountability partner. Every Monday morning at 9.30, we do a quick 10-minute call. What's your goals for this week? What's your schedule look like? Are you balancing? What do you need to say no to? You know, those because I, I need that. I know I need that to, to stay quality, you know. So who, who is your, not who is your kind of partner, but how did you come in contact? Is it somebody it's a friend. Known, yeah, it's a friend through the years, and yeah. she wanted to start setting goals, and we started setting goals, and over time it just got down to a weekly coaching call, and literally 10 minutes, she's out in Vegas, it's 6.30 your time, 9.30 mine, works great. Drop my daughter off, and make the call, and then we shoot an email of what's like the top five things you want to accomplish this week or what you focus on, and that's it. Just me saying it and writing it, all of a sudden, you know, is she really listening half the time? I don't really know. But it doesn't matter to me. I, you know what I mean? I'm accountable. So. In fact, she's willing to do it because I seem to be the most motiv motivated person in my circle. So everybody's like, you want to do that? <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have yeah. more. You do. Well, that's what I mean. Yes, and that's awesome. <laughs> that's, and that's great. And that's, that's, here's, I, I, I heard someone say one time, you're, you're going to end up to be the average of your five closest friends. I am trying to find five good friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and, you're, you're, and that's the thing, is a lot of people see that, a lot of people get held back by the haters, and they get held back by people who have that negative mindset, and that is fine for them. That's those people out there, that's totally cool, right? People come in, into circles like this because of like-mindedness, and, and it's people who are like that, they have that same... That, that same feeling right here, like right? they're more scared of having a job than they are a family, right? And and that is something that that is, that is fantastic. It will always help, uh, you know, move and, and take those steps towards actually making that better. Uh, so really, really good question. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. <laughs> Awesome, rapid fire. Number one thing that you have uh, learned from your experience um, getting started in entrepreneurship, what's the number one thing that you wish you could communicate to people just getting started or want to get started? I said already, uh, not everybody uh, is cut to be, uh, uh, to have a business. I'm an entrepreneurial man, so I'm going to rephrase that. An entrepreneurial mind, anybody can have an entrepreneurial mindset and it will be rewarded anywhere. Intra, so some people will call it intrapreneur, right? But whatever, so entrepreneur mindset will always be rewarded, but not everybody's cut up to have a, a, a business. Mm -hmm. Back to their own business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it would be, it's, it's do something, make something, try it, make it, um, you know, be okay with failure, but then know how to define failure. For me, it's, um, you know, find a mentor or a coach or somebody that will come alongside you in the details and is ahead of you. You've been there, done that. I mean, that's just so valuable to, to learn from someone who truly um, you trust and that would that, that really is invested and that would want to take that time and coach you along the way. For me, guys, it's awareness. Find out who you are and why you're around, and make every single decision you make from a perspective of gratitude because you know what that is. So thank you guys so much. Appreciate it.